welcome to another edition of Exiles TV. Bill Profito over cha, and over here. <laughs> I'm, I'm Kevin. Glad to have you with us. Uh, you know, I, I got a smile on my face right now, but it instantly turns to a frown. Is the first thing that uh, I woke up to this morning was news of the death of a friend of uh, of ours, frequent guest on this program on our radio show from years back. Uh, former state representative, a former candidate for mayor president of East Baton Rouge, Steve Carter passed away. Complications of COVID-19. And um, I think our city parish has suffered a real loss. Um, but we, uh, we wish the Carter family well. Yeah, 77 years old, so he was in that you know, time frame, frame of age where your pre-existing conditions can really take a hold of you. But uh, let me tell you about a pre-existing condition that I saw in Steve <laughs> Carter for years and years and years. And that was being a genuinely nice guy. Someone who really tried hard to do what was right. Uh, as a legislator, what I always liked about Steve was he would walk out of the chamber. He didn't care. He never sponsored a, we want to create the 26th state flower and call it the Baton Rouge Rose. He didn't want to sponsor bills that would put a plaque on a building that honored some campaign contributor's father-in-law. In other words, he, he wasn't fond of do-nothing legislation. Yeah, what he did a lot of was transportation, building proper roads, education, getting proper schools, and public safety, making sure that we could go out and about, be safe in our homes, be safe on the road, be safe in our places of business. That's what he did a lot of. Mm -hmm. And he did it really, really well. Steve, uh, in all the times that we had Steve on as a state representative and uh, also as a, um, a candidate for mayor, never once did Steve ever refuse an appearance uh, on the radio show or the television show. He postponed a couple of times, but it was just like, give me a couple days, get all my ducks in a row and make sure that I've got the right facts and then I'll come on. But he never once refused to, to join us and talk about things. And I always felt when you asked Steve a question, you got a straight answer because it was not rehearsed. It was, you could tell that he did, he did not have talking points assigned to memory. It was straight from the hip and straight from the brain. And uh, I've always admired plain talkers. I always have. Well, and I will tell you one thing about Steve that I always admired was that he was willing to take political risks if he thought something was right. You know, him talking seven or eight years ago about raising money probably with a fuel tax that would build a third bridge in, ba bridge in Baton Rouge. It's like, how dare you? A fuel tax? Raise money. Yeah. Well, how else are we going to get this bridge? It's not going to just fall out of the sky. I mean, that was politically risky for him. Mm -hmm. uh, he and Franklin Foyle with the bump plan, which didn't get adopted for airline highway service roads, that was politically risky. Mm -hmm. But he knew. I would have lo I would have loved that. You know, I make frequent trips north of Baton Rouge, and if I and I live uh, in southeast East Baton Rouge Parish, if I could have gotten on a, a bypass at I-12 and Airline and taken that to I-110 and bypassed all that going through downtown nonsense, I would have loved that, and I would have paid a toll to do it. I think a lot of people would have. Well, and and he he mastered he mastered a skill that there are a few politicians that have, but many more need. He always did it, whether he was getting laurels or brickbats thrown at him, he always did it with a good sense of humor and a very genial nature. Mm -hmm. And there are not too many people that have mastered that. There are not too many people that think that it's important to master that, and I can tell you, it is. Uh, I think in all of our interviews with Steve Carter, we only saw him angry once. And uh, that was when a particular piece of legislation that a lot of people thought was a good idea uh, failed. It was the bump. Yeah. Uh, and the bump was just shot down. It didn't even make it to the, to, to the legislative floor. It went, it went to a committee, and the committee said, nope. And he said, why? And they said, tolls. Nobody in Louisiana is going to pay tolls. It's like, have you tried asking? Yeah. No. We all got our finger on the pulse beat of the state, we all know. I think that the people of the state would pay tolls if it meant better roads and better routes. Well, and here's the thing. You have nothing to lose from those who decide to take longer time in traffic and 
not pay the tolls because you're making up the difference in the fuel tax that you're already getting mm -hmm. because they're spending time in stop and go traffic and they're using more fuel. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Steve was a an educator by trade. He had been an Air Force officer. I mean, he understood logistics and he could do math. But a lot of the people at that time in the legislature weren't interested in doing the math. Mm -hmm. They were interested in, in talking to somebody, you know, that didn't know a toll, you know, from a toll house cookie and saying, I saved you from those tolls. Like they were going to be mandatory. Mm -hmm. Steve also understood that eventually we were going to have to pay more per gallon in fuels tax to help fund our road situation in general. Uh, and again, his many efforts to do that. I don't like paying more in taxes, but there does is. anybody like paying more taxes? No, nobody does. No, but his many efforts to do that met with defeat. But I almost guarantee you that this this spring in the legislature there is going to be a bill to raise the fuels tax, and I would not be surprised if it is not passed this time around. So anyway, Steve, you will be sorely, sorely missed by this community and the state in general. Thank you for all your years of service, and may God rest you. Well, and again, I you know again, I when when this happened late in the evening, the first thing that I thought about was, you know, you always get a knee-jerk reaction when it's somebody you know that passes away. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I could think about, and it's the best thing I can say about him for all of his achievements, in, in, I mean, he was a very successful tennis coach at LSU. A lot of people forget that. He won, they won national championships. And for all of his achievements legislatively, the first thing I thought was, what a great guy and if that's not enough I'm sorry but it's the best I got and I and I think it's a good thing to remember somebody by upon being notified of their passing what a great guy yep. he really was he loved the state and he loved the city and he dedicated the last years of his life to service you know I always thought when he came on the radio show when he came on this TV show you got 100% of Steve Carter for whatever amount of time you had him. Mm -hmm. There were no rules with him. He never came in and said, I don't want to talk about this. Never. Never once. Yeah. No rules. Rest in peace, Steve Carter. God bless you, Steve. Uh, another victim of uh, complications of COVID-19. We'll take our first break of the hour and be back in just a moment with more on Exiles. Let's talk about this submerged truck. Uh, Hi, I'm Bobby Yarborough with Manda Fine Meats. Here at Manda, we know what the folks of South Louisiana love. They love great flavored smoked sausage, delicious deli meats, and specialty items like boudin and andouille sausage. Manda Fine Meats has been providing these products since 1947. We produce them right here in Baton Rouge, so you know you're always getting the freshest product at your local grocery store. Manda Fine Meats. Taste the fresh local flavor in everything we make. Make it Manda every time.
Welcome back to Exiles TV. Glad to have you along with us. Um, very strange accident uh, in Ascension Parish. Early, early, early in the in the morning, uh, it was still you know dead of night because this happened about 4 a.m. And, and it illustrates, uh, I guess, uh, it, it's a real interesting tale about who's out on the road at 4 a.m. with kids in the car. Um, two adults, two children were pulled from a submerged vehicle. It was a single vehicle crash, and it happened uh, in a body of water on George Lambert Road at Highway 429 uh, near the town of Sanama. Now, I am not exactly familiar with that intersection, but mm -hmm. I know that there's not a whole hell of a lot out there. Um, no, but those roadside ditches and bayous can be pretty deep well places. this thing is a full-size titan uh nissan pickup truck extra cab full mm -hmm. size it went completely under water uh according to uh, our buddy trooper first class taylor scrantz uh the vehicle became submerged people at the scene were able to rescue all four of the occupants now remember two of them children not young adults or teens as categorized by the people making this report, which is state police, children. I can only think that there had to have been other traffic that was there when this occurred. Oh, yeah. Or else they could have easily drowned. I or mean, at four near, in the morning, you go in the water, and if there's nobody to see it happen, Yeah, look. Nearby homes might have heard uh, some crashing noises or something, but one adult and one child are in critical condition. One of the occupants had to be revived at the scene, which means CPR or something like that, you know. Uh, and they say alcohol is suspected as a factor in the so crash. A single vehicle crash at four in the morning is almost always either asleep at the wheel or asleep at the wheel because you're drunk. Yeah. Or, well, passed out at the wheel. Yeah. There's a difference between being asleep at the wheel and being passed out at the wheel. And, and but again, that, that, when it's single vehicle crash, that's very telling, and it's almost always due to alcohol. Well, it's almost always one person in the vehicle. Right. In this case, there was another adult and two small children. Yeah, so I mean, what are you doing running the roads under the influence? With two kids in the car. Yep. Should that be a punishable offense? Well, I think it is, actually. I mean, drunk driving with two small children in the car, is that an aggravated drunk driving? Or? I, th I think it pretty much is, yeah. That's, uh, but, well, it's, I'm glad that everybody made it out, but what a strange accident. But and I at mean, four in the morning, they're, they're just so lucky that people were able to get help in time to avoid utter disaster. But you know, it it kind of makes you wonder how much late night dangerous driving either because of fatigue or because of alcohol is going on with more than one person in the car i mean it's bad enough it's if it's one person mm -hmm. but when you have a single vehicle accident with four people who all were in jeopardy of losing their life it's not like they hit a pole at 12 miles an hour this thing is so dented up from its impact with water they had to be flying yeah. When they went in there. Well, and you could see that it went n not just into the water, but into the muddy bottom. Because mm -hmm. it's got that gray, nasty mud all it, over the It wasn't the a sides. soft landing. Yeah. So uh, I'm glad that uh, an absolute crisis was diverted, but uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens as far as, what, you know, charges for the driver. Well, we have, and we have another crisis with this story. Yeah, well, I noticed that. There's a sentence in this story that bothers me. There's a two. Bit. <laughs> Go ahead with the one that bothers you. Uh, the sentence that stuck out to me was police say one adult and one child is in critical condition. The other two victims suffered minor injuries. One adult and one child is, is in, in critical, critical condition. condition. Are, and are then in critical condition. The very, uh, the very next, uh, the very next uh, uh, sentence has is attributed to Trooper First Class Taylor Scrantz, and it says, Scrantz say alcohol is suspected as a factor in well, the crash. that could be written off to a simple typo. You missed a letter. But Scrantz say that alcohol is suspected. So once again, WAFB covers themselves in glory, in glory for the uh, grammar 
department and the sentence usage department. You know, and it's, it's subject I mean, verb agreement and all the things that journalists are supposed to be able to do with their hands tied behind their back. Remember when journalists were expected to know the AP style book front and back without having to consult it? Uh, I and bet yes, you were expected, you were expected to have a working knowledge of print English. I will, I will bet you if they have a copy of the AP style book, they're using it as a doorstop. Uh, or maybe they got a table with a wobbly leg. and they, Yeah. Because the style book's about that thick. But this is happening all the time. Uh, uh, Franz Borghardt, our buddy the attorney, got into it again. Channel 9 was the offender on this one, but it could have been anybody. Uh, yesterday's reporting of the court proceedings of Reverend Tony Spell were in the headline. They wrote that the court failed uh, uh, to allow his motion to squash. It was a motion to quash, not yeah. a motion to squash. You don't squash an action or squash evidence. You quash it with it. Just Q-U-A-S-H. You can eat squash. You quash. can squash a bug. You could actually squash a squash. Somebody pointed it out. They if corrected it's right it. Enough. They they corrected it on the website. But as you pointed out, you know the 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 the, the correction is made after the damage is done. Mm -hmm. Or as I put it on the podcast this morning, that's like locking the barn door after the you know livestock has all escaped. Um, I don't know. I, I I think one of the problems is that they have people in the hierarchy of news organizations that are hiring people for less money than they should be making for this important job. I have been told that entry-level positions at television stations, especially not major market television stations, uh, pay ridiculously low salary. I think they think they get what they get. I think they don't supervise them closely because they would be spending a great deal of their time correcting their use of the English language. But I also think most news directors now are not actually people who sat in front of a mic or whose picture appeared near a byline, who sat in front of a television camera, and they're insulated from something very, very important. They don't feel the public looking down their nose at them and questioning their credibility because they cannot properly use the language. The news directors, most of them, are not on camera anymore. Remember when every television station, their news director had at least one on-camera shift where you could say, you know, that's, that's uh, what's his name? He's the news director. That's, what's her name? She's the news director. Well, and remember when the news director, uh, and, uh, trying to remember, news director and station manager mm -hmm. used to come on and do an op-ed. Yeah, an editorial. An editorial piece. But uh, nowadays, it's like, I don't know if there's that many people could tell you who is the news director at Channel 9 or Channel 2. Channel 2, it's, uh, it's um, the news director is still... Um, yeah, it's that guy. Yeah, him. That guy from yeah, the morning that, show. That guy, that guy. Pastrick. He's not the news director. He's not? No, who is it? No, it's, uh, uh, it's Lee somebody or other. Uh, and actually, it also might be, it was, it was, now I think it's the guy who got arrested with a reporter running through the Garden District and running up on a police action, and they managed to talk themselves into getting arrested. Oh, no, Remember? I thought he was long gone, that dude. No, he's just off camera. Now. <laughs> he's, a, he's a news director. They're keeping him where he can't do any harm. But yeah, I mean. Strange yeah. times, but, I mean, folks. If, if, if you and I didn't have to face this every single day, we might get a little lax with our language or our grooming or, you know, whatever else that you're supposed to have when you do television. Wouldn't be quite as careful when we wrote things up. See, that a news director does it here from the public. Every time I slip and stutter, there is somebody that will text me or call me going, Talk much? I saw yeah. what you said with that, you know. See, you know, if I were the news director of a television station, especially one that bragged about the Murrow Awards, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. and the Sun, Sun Coast Emmys and blah, 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 uh, I would be, I would make it my business to view the newscasts and check the website. And I'd be the de facto editor. I'd be like looking at stuff and going, ah, oh, that ain't right, that ain't right. Well, the thing is, they don't want to do that because they'd have to take action. Uh, I will tell you, I, uh, I happened to run into a news director uh, from one of our local stations, and I, and I asked him, I said, so, have you got a consultant that is interfering with the writing of your news copy 
injecting phrases and extra adjectives? And he said, no. Why do you ask? I said, well, so-and-so used the term leader about nine times in one story, and this is something that is happening every single day, that everybody's a leader. I said, I don't think your news writers or your newscasters get to confer that title. It's an administrator. It's a spokesman with the state police. It's, it's a member, uh, the fire chief. It's not a leader. There are leaders in the House and in the Senate at the state and local level. You know, there are community leaders who claim that. But you don't, you don't say a legislator is a leader unless they're in a leadership position. I said, and it's happening constantly. And he said, well, I haven't heard it. And I'm thinking to myself, well, then you don't watch your own air. Mm -hmm. But guess what? A week later, it was gone. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? Yeah. We're going to take another brief pause. We're going to talk about Baton Rouge Police. We're going to talk about community outreach. We're going to talk about some steps being made to help to curve crime by reaching out to people's hearts. Yeah. And mine. Sergeant Belford Johnson, who is the commander of community services for BRPD, is up with us next. So stick around. Live and play on the fairway at Greystone Golf and Country Club, a serene, challenging golf destination located in Denham Springs. For tee times and membership opportunities, go to greystonecountryclub.com. From appetizers, pasta dishes, and entrees, La Contea takes pride in preparing all the Italian cuisine we know you love. Enjoy live music every Thursday through Saturday from 6 to 9, happy hour weekdays from 3 to 6, and brunch on Sundays from 11 to 2, as well as dinner portion-sized lunch specials for under $10. Visit our website to view our menu and book a party or meeting in our large banquet room. Once you try La Contea, your Italian dining will change forever. No one can stop me when I taste the feeling. Nothing could ever bring me down. It's the feeling. Hi, I am Dr. Farrell Frugier, Jr., and I am a general dentist at Frugier Family Dentistry. I was born and raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I went to Catholic High School, LSU, and LSU School of Dentistry in New Orleans, where I received my DDS degree in 1986. I always have and will continue to be committed to continuing my education, to invest in technology, which makes the diagnosis and delivery of dentistry more thorough, more comfortable, and more aesthetically pleasing. In our practice, we are here to serve the patients. We want to improve their quality of life and to develop relationships with our patients. In dentistry, we have a chance to impact lives on a daily basis, not just by doing dentistry, but by getting to know them and being a part of their life. We also believe in giving back to our community. So every year, we get back to the Greater Baton Rouge Food Bank, Toys for Tots, and Mary Bird Perkins Cancer Center. Please stop by and visit our office. We would love to take care of you and your family. Team Honda wants to thank you for once again making us Louisiana's number one new car dealer by offering you never before seen savings. For the first time ever, get 0% financing up to 60 months on some of your favorite Honda models. Get thousands in savings right now at Team Honda on Segan Lane. With Exiles TV, glad to have you with us. We've asked the question many times, what can BRPD do to help reach out to the community and help get a better understanding of why it's important that we don't break the law and why it's important we don't shoot each other? Well, it's a nationwide problem and the nationwide solution seems to have taking men and women who are in uniform, who are serving and protecting and giving them over to that community and having them provide that access. Uh, Sergeant Belford Johnson is with us. Uh, he is the commander have you with us. of Community Service Division. Sarge, you, you got a tough job here. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's getting more tough every, uh, as years goes by, you know, just 
the atmosphere, uh, the way the world is going. So we have to change with the times. We were talking earlier on our podcast about this horrible case in Lake Charles, yeah. where the, the, the four teenagers actually took knives off the shelf of a Walmart mm -hmm. and stabbed to death another 15-year-old. Right. And I mean, everybody says, how do you reach those kids before it comes to that point? Mm -hmm. And I, I'm thinking every officer who does what you do has to ask themselves that same question. Yes, yes. And that's another tough question also, but, and we have tough answers for it. Well, what we're doing, we're reaching out to the community. We have a, uh, brought back the Explore program. Mm -hmm. The Explore program is for kids for ages 14 to 18 years of age. And what we do, we try to put them on a career path of uh, being a first responder with an emphasis on law enforcement. So we want to kind of get them, I guess, comfortable with us learn what to do when you're dealing with police officers um, and hopefully they like it enough that they might want to become a police officer one day when they get older. Does this have a lot of, hey, let me prove to you we're not the enemy and you could be one of us? Is that where this starts? Yes, it does. I, I can tell you like this. When I grew up, I grew up in a tough neighborhood, uh, affectionately known as Dixie, uh, off the Plank Road area of Winburn. Mm -hmm. So that's where I grew up and it, it was tough. and the people I grew up with did not like the police. Guess what? I didn't like the police. Until I met some real good, fine police officers that changed my mind. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to do for these young people in the, in the community in our city. So you've got a big task ahead of you if you're going to try and change some hearts and minds. Mm -hmm. The one thing, looking through the prism of what happened in, in Lake Charles. Clearly these girls were not concerned with or giving any thought to the consequence yes. of taking a knife and sticking it in a, in a, in a fellow human being. I mean, how, how do you address that message to young people that there are consequences for your actions? Unfortunately, <laughs> it is very true what you just said. A lot of young people do not have fear of consequences or of what they do or their actions. So what I try to do is bring them in, look, this is what can happen to you. We even have, okay, let me explain my program a little bit. Sure, please. please. So with my program, we have partnerships with the coroner's office, the DA office, EMS, and, uh, and fire department, and Boy Scouts of America, we, it's a big conglomerate. Mm -hmm. So they have, they, they experience it all. They get to get CPR, first aid training, and then they get to ride with EMS, do sprint rides. So they go to calls and see what happens to a person if they get shot, or if they get stabbed, or you know, the, the, see the family crying, you know, see the whole, what, what happens, the, the consequences of your actions. Uh, we take them to the, uh, the uh, courthouse. So they can go sit in trials and see what can happen to you. Okay, you see that you stabbed somebody, you hurt somebody, you took someone's life. Now you have to go deal with the court system. You see what happens to you in there and how your life can be taken from you and or years of your life can be taken from you. So uh, we even take them to the coroner's office if they're old enough. They get to see a, a, an autopsy where what happens to your body, what, what a doctor has to do um, to find out wh why you died or what caused this, was that. So it really exposes them to real life. And, and unfortunately, I think we have to expose kids to real life because they have so many, I guess, um, avenues to like social media, computers. They have access to so much that we didn't when we were young. So we have to combat that with the truth. Well, it sounds like there's a pretty good amount of tough love in this as well. Yes. You know, because it is not pretty watching an autopsy, but when you're, when you're standing there and you're saying, this is how the coroner has to take you apart if you get shot or if you OD on drugs. Right. This, this, you, would you want your mom to see this? Right. Um, 15, 20 years or so, scared straight seemed to be making some kind of inroads, but then people thought it was unnecessarily harsh yeah. uh, to, to take kids into a prison and 
you know, let them, you know, get get the fear of God put into them by, you know, people that were lifers in prison. But is there any element of maybe getting people who have been incarcerated to come and talk to these kids? I do plan on doing a field trip to the prison, taking them to, to see, because that's another step. Mm -hmm. That's another phase of doing wrong, the end result. So I would, I do plan on doing that and letting them go into the prisons and have some prisoners come out and say, look, don't, don't do what I did. Because mm -hmm. a lot of those stories are the same. They grew up, they thought they were tough, and they made the wrong decision, and look where they landed. Well, I, I like the fact that, you know, this is going to be uh, a, a registered explorer post. Yes. Now, is EMS keeping theirs as well, or are you putting them all together? No, they, they keep theirs as well. The fire department is actually doing one also. Uh, but we just partner up. We, we try to, I guess what you say, cross-learn, cross-teach. Yeah. So they can get all the experience, you know, from all angles. Well, and, and when they get older, they can make a decision. Okay, well, maybe the law enforcement wasn't for me. Maybe I want to be a paramedic or a doctor. Maybe I want to be a lawyer or, or a judge. So we, we put them on a path of, okay, let's decide what you want to do as a career. Get them interested. Mm -hmm. So you get, you, if you can grab a child's interest, and you can mold them, they can be a real productive citizen. And not only that, if you can grab a child and you can do right by that child, guess what? The parent's looking at that. The parents are like, okay. Because maybe the parent didn't like the police. Mm -hmm. But it, it was like, man, you start breaking walls down. Well, I like also that they have to sign on to the rules and the structure, mm -hmm. something many of these young folks maybe never had at home. Correct. You know, you want to be part of this Explorer Post, Here's when we meet. You got to be there. You got to be squared away in your appearance. I don't know if you're going to have them wearing uniforms mm -hmm. or not, mm -hmm. but you got to be squared away and you're going to follow the plan for that particular meeting. Correct. And that's something a lot of these kids have never had. But they, when they get in, they love it. Mm -hmm. And they, what else I, I, I noticed, these kids love when they, they uh, obtain rank and then they get to be the ones, okay, you need to do this, you need to do that. So it gives them responsibility in the sense of uh, and a tangible reward for yes. the time they've already invested in it. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's a great idea. How much flexibility are y'all going to have to take maybe the kids that have attained some rank, they've achieved something. Mm -hmm. They're 15 now. They've been in it for a year and they've proven that they they got their head in the game. Are you going to have flexibility to take them on ride-alongs with police officers and things? Unfortunately, that's why we use the EMS as ride-alongs. I don't feel comfortable putting, in this day and age, putting a child in a car with a police officer. Mm -hmm. I can understand that. Yeah. I so, and man, I, our goal is to keep them safe, but to educate them at the same time. Roughly how many young people are we talking about here? Um, I had 20 before the COVID, mm -hmm. and my numbers kind of dwindled, but I'm trying to bump these numbers back up. So if I can get 20, 30, 40 kids in, I, I, I'll be. Then is there, is there a finite, time limit for the program? I no, mean, do they graduate the program? They do they? graduate. It's, it's a year-round program. Mm -hmm. So when you, once you're in a year, you get uh, go to graduation. Mm -hmm. And then we recruit more kids. Yeah. We re only do recruitment once a year. Mm -hmm. So you have a constant refilling of the slots. Correct. I would imagine, like EMS, you're going to get to the point where it's going to be competitive to get in, mm -hmm. Hopefully. which is a good place to be. Right. And the good thing with us, I also brought back the cadets. Well, the chief and I, we brought back the cadets. And that is when you make 18 and you're like, okay, I really want to do this. I really want to be a police officer. What uh, the chief is going to do is going to hire you as an employee. And you're going to really get into it then. You're going to be working in all the different divisions uh, and see how police officers and the, the whole job functions and works. I'm sorry about this guy. No, no, no. no. <laughs> you're doing great. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by this. So once they're... they're they're 18 and they're working, they say uh, 21. And we also encourage everyone to get a, their degree, you know. So we're, we're pushing them to go to school. We want people with their uh, criminal justice degrees or what have you. So once they make 21, they say, okay, I still enjoying what I'm doing. We're going to put them into the academy. So they'll get an academy slot if their record's good. Correct. And they've been completing education as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, I, I can see something, and I and I hope that it comes true, that you're going to have 
community leaders, business people that are going to start offering these kids scholarships to go to college while they're in your cadet program. And that'd be awesome. Oh, man. And it also occurred to me, not everybody is necessarily college material, mm -hmm. but employers may be interested in tapping into some of these young people, yeah. you know, for jobs. Yeah. The, the one thing a lot of kids don't understand is what Senator John Kennedy calls the dignity of work. When you do a job and you're rewarded with a paycheck and you've got that tangible, you, you feel better about yourself. You a lot you of do. people do. You do. Well, and if I remember correctly, years ago, as a project for somebody, I had to look at the police department budget and the fire department budget and EMS budget, and there is a line item for cadets, and it's got their salary and all that. It's mm -hmm. not like you have to invent the, reinvent the wheel. It's mm -hmm. there. It's there. Yeah. It was a program we had years ago. Um, over 20 years ago, mm -hmm. about 25 years ago. And it, so somehow it went by the wayside, but we went back and got those positions and we're going forward. Well, I want to continue with Sergeant Johnson and then talk more about the explorers and the cadets. And you all are doing a big presentation on this on the Friday. Eight, this Friday. This Friday. I want to talk about that as well. We're going to have plenty of time when we come back. Stick around. More with Sergeant Belford Johnson. He is the commander of community uh, uh, impact policing in, at BRPD. We'll be back on Exiles TV. Bolello's Furniture and Appliances, your dependable independent. Depend on us for service, for selection, for price. Get huge Whirlpool savings. Shop now and save on Whirlpool appliances throughout the store. Plus, experience our price match guarantee and ask about special financing. You can depend on the know-how of people who live appliances every day. Bolello's Furniture and Appliances, your dependable independent with nationwide buying power. Hello guys, it's Debbie. It's time. I've got a brand new location. 10510 Airline Highway, Baton Rouge, next to After Five Tuxedos. We have the perfect spot to get all your wedding and formal wear needs. Come see our one-of-a-kind name brand and get great prices. With 30 years experience, the best customer service anywhere. It's Debbie's Bridal, Airline Highway, Baton Rouge. See you soon. Hi, I'm Hurricane Betsy Barnes. And I'm Dr. Kay Siller with the Rocket Right Show. We are two busy blondes on the go showing off life in Louisiana. Watch us on Pelican Sports Network. And talk 107.3 FM. Check local listings for times. Of all the auto brands on the road today, only one has been named the best auto brand for six straight years. That brand is Mazda. Come shop and save on the award-winning lineup of new Mazdas right now at Baton Rouge's Mazda dealer, Team Mazda on Airline. I owed the IRS $10,000. The IRS garnished my wages. They put a lien on my house. I'm self-employed and didn't report all my income. They claim I owe a lot more than I do. The IRS is the most powerful collection agency in the world. They do not give up until you pay. I couldn't sleep. We were being audited. I called Tax Solutions Now and a great big weight was lifted off my shoulders. I called Tax Solutions Now and they got the IRS off my back. Tax Solutions Now had my wage garnishment lifted in 48 hours. Tax Solutions Now can get you help. Our agents know the rules, can stop the pain, and get you the best deal. Tax Solutions Now saved my business. I qualified for the Fresh Start program. I paid less than I owed. We connect you with a team of former IRS agents and tax professionals who get the IRS off your back. Time is running out. Call Tax Solutions Now. Call 800-778-4345. 800-778-4345. Welcome back to Exiles TV. Bill Perfetti, Kevin Gallagher. We are joined today by Sergeant Bel uh, Belford Johnson, who is the commander of community policing, uh, uh, community services, excuse me, at BRPD. And we're talking about two fun things that are going to be very impactful for our community. Uh, an explorer post that is multidimensional. It gets young people between 14 and 18 into the actual realm of policing, firefighting, EMSing and they can progress and you know explorers are part of boy scouts of america and then bringing back the police cadet program mm -hmm. now 
when we talk about these two things, I got to ask, how much help do you have? <laughs> well, I have, uh, I have some help. <laughs> I can tell you that. Uh, it, we're kind of slim, but we're growing, mm -hmm. you know, so we're growing. So. But there is, there is budget to yeah. be able to do this. Yes. I mean, you're obviously, you're, you're a ranking member, you're a sergeant. Yes. So, you know, your salary is now going to be spent with these young people as opposed to being out there supervising accident scenes or crime scenes or whatever sergeants normally do. Correct. Correct. So they're making an investment in this. Yes, they are. Yeah. Um, we hopefully, we're getting to train these young people up and if we can put them on the right path and they choose to be police officers, we, <laughs> a lot of the training is going to be done. A lot of the, uh, the attitude is going to be corrected. Uh, I guess when you say we're priming them for their career, getting ready. But is it fair to say even if they don't want a career in law enforcement, firefighting, EMS, you're still teaching them some important life skills that might keep them from going to jail or getting killed on the street? Right, right. What we're trying to do is prevent future incidents with these young people that they're going to have run in with the laws or get hurt or end up hurting someone. We're actually preventing crime in the future, if you look at it. So with them as, as ambassadors of the police department and going out and talking the great things about our department and sharing that with other people and other people their age, it's really helping us. Do you ever get the uh, the hard case, the proverbial tough nut to crack, the the one that you just have a really tough time, getting making that breakthrough and making them understand yes. that there's a way to yeah. get through life without you know winding up in jail, winding up yes. going against the system. Yes, um, you gotta understand this program is, is for kids that want to be here. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can't force a kid to be there. Yep. Uh, a lot of times parents are like, oh, I want my kid in there. He needs this. He needs that. I'm, I'm great. Bring him to me. I will do my best. But if that child ultimately doesn't want to be there, there's no way I can force them mm -hmm. to do what is need to be done. Uh, unfortunately. But I will not give up on that kid. Like I tell him, look, he may, this might not be the program for him, but look, if you need mentoring or you need someone to talk to or reach out to me. But that's, that is still part of my job as community police. How's the buy-in amongst your colleagues on the police department, uh, are they pretty much all in on this? They, do they have your back on this? If one of them stumbles upon one of your explorers, is he going to call you and let you know? Yes. Look, uh, Johnny, Johnny kind of crossed the line here. It can go either way. What do you want me to do with him? Yes. And uh, in fact, I've <laughs> been receiving phone calls all week. Look, I have a kid I'm mentoring. I'm bringing him. You know, so they're on board because they know they see the bigger picture with these saving, saving these kids and getting them a, a great opportunity to, to bridge this gap between us and the community and their families it's, it's and hopefully, hopefully these kids will pass along what they're what they're experiencing and what they're learning to their peers out there right. in the neighborhoods and hopefully given enough time we may be able to turn the tide where young right. people don't make these foolish decisions that get wind them up you know against going against the system and possibly wind up in juvie right so like i say they're our ambassadors in the community we're going to put nothing but good things into these kids we're going to pour our knowledge and our love into them and we want them to share that throughout the community all right now again i want to make clear we're talking about the explorer post and we're also talking about renewing the police cadet program uh, we got about three minutes left, mm -hmm. so tell us about what's going to happen at this presentation on Friday, who can come, what time, and then we'll also talk about the different qualifications from the Explorer Post to be a police cadet. Okay. Um, the Explorer first, first Nighter slash recruitment event is going to happen this Friday on the 29th from 6 to 8 p.m. It's going to be at the uh, Baton Rouge Police Headquarters, 9000 Airline, in the Academy, mm -hmm. the Training Academy. Um, Everyone's welcome. I want you to bring your kids. Bring if you, if you don't have kids, <laughs> bring someone else's kids. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I want I want to expose as many people to this program as possible, and I want to give the knowledge, all the knowledge that I can give possible, so you'll be equipped to make decision. Okay, is this for my kid, or is this for my niece? This is for my nephew, grandchild. You know, 
you, we'll let, let you make that determination once you hear our presentation. But uh, we're going to feed you. We're going to have a little jambalaya uh, from the jambalaya shop. We're going to have some horses out there, motor, motor men, you know, kind of see the different divisions because that's what we do also. Uh, man, we also had the bomb squad come out. They was blowing up stuff. Oh, every, every kid likes oh, that. Oh man, it was awesome. They figured they had crime scene where they had to go through. A, uh, they they staged the scene. They had to go find the clues and and learn about crime scene. So they're gonna learn a lot. I guarantee you. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna guess we can kind of assure everybody, but this is kind of a no warrant search night. No, it's not. We're not searching for warrants or anything like that. So come out, enjoy learn uh, just listen and i guarantee you won't be uh, uh disappointed now if somebody is interested in the cadet program what's the process for that okay the cadet program you have to be at least 18 years old and you have to take a civil service test because at that point you're going to be a, a employee mm -hmm. yeah because it's a paid job it's a paid job and we're looking for kids in college for that and if you have an interest in being a police officer, come on, go down to civil service, take the test, and fill out the application, and we'll be waiting for you. All right, so this Friday, though, let's give them the time again and the place, police headquarters, 9, the Old Woman's Hospital. Yeah, yeah. Old Woman's Hospital, 9000 Airline Highway. And what time? And that's from 6 to 8 p.m. Well, it sounds like a good program, and it sounds like you've got... Uh, you got something to tell these young people that's probably going to save their lives. Yes. And maybe put them on a great career path. Yes. Yes. So we thank you for that, Sergeant Belford Johnson. He is the commander of community services, BRPD. Remember, the big open house is this Friday, 9000 Airline Highway at police headquarters. And be some interesting stuff to see and do. So, like he, like he said, bring your kids or bring other people's kids if you don't have kids. <laughs> Thanks for being with us, Sergeant. All right. Thank you. More to come on Exiles TV in just a moment. Corolla for just $189 a month or get a 20 Camry for just $19,995. It's a year full of savings starting right now, right here at Team Toyota. Hi, I am Dr. Farrell Frugier Jr. and I am a general dentist at Frugier Family Dentistry. I was born and raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I went to Catholic High School, LSU, and LSU School of Dentistry in New Orleans, where I received my DDS degree in 1986. I always have and will continue to be committed to continuing my education, to invest in technology, which makes the diagnosis and delivery of dentistry more thorough, more comfortable, and more aesthetically pleasing. In our practice, we are here to serve the patients. We want to improve their quality of life and to develop relationships with our patients. In dentistry, we have a chance to impact lives on a daily basis, not just by doing dentistry, but by getting to know them and being a part of their life. We also believe in giving back to our community. So every year, we get back to the Greater Baton Rouge Food Bank, Toys for Tots, and Mary Bird Perkins Cancer Center. Please stop by and visit our office. We would love to take care of you and your family. From appetizers, pasta dishes, and entrees, La Contea takes pride in preparing all the Italian cuisine we know you love. Enjoy live music every Thursday through Saturday from 6 to 9, happy hour weekdays from 3 to 6, and brunch on Sundays from 11 to 2 as well as dinner portion-sized lunch specials for under $10. Visit our website to view our menu and book a party or meeting in our large banquet room. Once you try La Contea, your Italian dining will change forever. Live and play on the fairway at Greystone Golf and Country Club, a serene, challenging golf destination located in Denham Springs. For tee times and membership opportunities, go to greystonecountryclub.com. Hi, business owners. Phase three. Woohoo! But do your customers know you're back? Well, that's where the Clarence Bug Show and Pelican Broadcasting can help. Right now, we've got great rates on advertising packages to help you get the word out. Shoot me an email at bugsclarence 
at gmail.com. Or better yet, call me up. I'd love to talk with you. 225-485-6839. Let's get together and make Phase 3 the best it can possibly be. Got termites? Get Premier Pest. PremierPestServices.com Welcome back to Exiles TV. A few short minutes here before uh, we wrap things up. Don't forget the Clarence Bug Show follows us immediately afterwards. So uh, stick around for some good talk there. So uh, what have we got? We've got uh, four people drastically uh, in danger in a truck crash in the dead of night. Mm -hmm. they, I think it's, a, it's just a miracle that somebody was able, first responders were able to get there and pull this vehicle out of the water before somebody died. I mean, completely submerged. They had some serious luck on their side. And at four in the morning, I mean, your expectation of anybody seeing the accident, calling for help with the accident, very, very slim. Um, especially on what's not exactly a busy, busy road. Well, yeah, I'm not, I'm not familiar Parish. with that area of Santa Four, 429 is a busier road than George Lambert, but, um, you know, still, I, I, I think that it is Providence that someone was able to call and get emergency people mm -hmm. out there right away. Um, uh, by the way, uh, some of you will know this name, some of you won't. Uh, about the same time as Steve Carter passing, uh, we lost uh, another good guy in the, in the Baton Rouge community, Paul West. Uh, Paul was a very highly specialized attorney mm -hmm. here in Baton Rouge. And he actually helped us navigate through a lot of our zoning and construction issues for the big projects in Baton Rouge that have happened over the last 20 years or so. Mm -hmm. But uh, he was also a constitutional expert that various other law firms and, 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 and branches of government would call on so they wouldn't put their foot in the mess. Uh, and, and Paul just was dealt a bad, sand, a bad hand. He had some sort of a, a rare fungal infection in his lungs. Really? And they said, we're going to treat you with antibiotics, we're going to take you to the hospital, we're going to, you know, uh, uh, treat you, and, and you should be as good as new. And it turned into a huge bacterial pneumonia that they just couldn't touch. And, and he expired, uh, uh, as I understand, about the si same time as Steve Carter. But this was not corona, uh, no, coronavirus related. No, it was not related. corona. Interesting. It was not corona. And sad at the same time. Yeah. Uh, other business going on. Uh, we got a uh, big expansion coming up. Shintech over in West Baton Rouge Parish. Yep. $1.3 billion to expand its manufacturing and packaging facilities in Iberville and West Baton Rouge parishes. Uh, the world's leading manufacturer of polyvinyl chloride. PVC. PVC, where would we be without it? I'll bet you your house has, uh, has running water thanks to PVC. Yeah. Unless you live in a really old house. Without worrying about lead. Uh, or steel. Or steel, yeah. Uh, you, you know, I mean, for a while, their steel pipe was the way to go. But, you know, anytime that you're running water through metal, you're going to have uh, a particles problem. Uh, some people don't feel all that safe about PVC, but it's a hell of a lot safer than running your water through, but through metal. But here's the dollars, okay? This is what's interesting. The, the Shintech expansion in Iberville Parish will create 30 new direct job, average annual salary, 86 grand plus benefits. Yipes. And so does it say the hiring manager is over there? Yeah, please call. Hey, do you want a media flack? I'll do it. Yeah, come on. 129 new indirect jobs uh, for the capital region, and they're going to retain the 530 existing jobs in Iverville and West Baton Rouge, uh, where they've operated since 1999. And you know, I, again, I don't want to do the nana nana poo poo thing. That's not what this is about. This is kind of a let me refresh everybody's memories. When this com company was saying, we want to come to the capital region, we want to build here, we, we want to make a home here, and we want to pay people here, and just about everybody from the state legislature down to the dog catcher was like oh no we don't want another big plant we want different kinds of industries well our geography is perfect for large plants like this mm -hmm. 
And they fought these people tooth and nail. Oh, I remember the... And this was before the big, huge tax breaks and all that. And this company hung in there, and they built a big presence that is paying people really, really good wages. And like I said, I'm not trying to do the nana nana poo poo on you. No, but I would like to say this about Shintek. They were very, very patient with the nonsense going on in Louisiana. Yeah, they were patient, yes. Shintek is a Japanese wholly owned mm. subsidiary of the Japanese-based Shinetsu Chemical Company. The Japanese are not known for brooking idiots and fools when they're doing business. But they were very, very patient with the shenanigans going on here in Louisiana, and they finally got their plant open, and now this big expansion. It's going to be good. Will it offset the job losses in the oil patch as a result of executive orders by the Biden administration in its first days well, in office? I, I want some numbers on that because uh, I want to know how much refining from new holes in federal drilling lands we are doing in the state of Louisiana. I am hoping it's not too much at this point, so it won't be an immediate problem, but it's eventually going to be a problem, no yep. doubt about that. Uh, here's the question I have for the Biden administration. Why did we, why did we make a 60-day moratorium on drilling or sales offshore? What was the motivation for that? There's nothing going on offshore. Not, we didn't have a big spill. Yeah. Nothing's at threat right now. So why did President Biden come in and do a 60-day drilling and further expansion moratorium in, in the Gulf. I don't understand that at all. Like I, I think said, that, I I think that when a president facts. does something like that, they should explain why they've done it. Exactly. I, I agree with you. I, and I want to look at some of the facts because this could be one of these shut up and get back in the truck thing to the environmentalists. We may not be processing any, any oil from federal holes right now anyway. Mm -hmm. It could be one of those. But I, I want to get the facts. Look, our time is at an end. Thanks so much for being with us today. We thank our guests from BRPD. And uh, again, the weather is going to get a little dicey again this afternoon. Could be nasty. So be careful in those vehicles out there. You don't want to go into a big hole in the ground in Santa Ma. Thanks for being with us. God bless. Take care. Bye-bye.